ways. So we got this function. So this was one of the uh, problems on the written homework that you would have had to do. So graph this function. So the number A is an unspecified constant. I did say it was positive. So that's, that's actually important. So assume A is positive. That's all. OK, so what do we actually have to do to graph this? Well, first, we have to get the, the first and second derivative. Now, I guess it's worth actually asking, how would you find the derivative of this function? Like, let's say this were a homework question. Caleb, how would you find this? I'd uh, expand it out first correctly. You think you would expand it out? So if I expand uh, this out, I'm going to get a fifth degree wait, polynomial. Actually, no, no, no. I'll just use, I just use the product rule. But then for the second chunk, I use the, uh, the power rule. OK, so if I, so f is going to be a fifth degree polynomial. Everyone sees that, right? If I take the derivative, it's going to end up being a fourth degree polynomial. And if I take the second derivative, it's going to end up being a third degree polynomial. And not only that, all the coefficients are going to depend on a. So I would say expanding and taking the derivative is absolutely not the way to go. Because remember, at some point, you need to set these things equal to 0. And I don't think you're about to solve this fourth degree polynomial. But if you use product rule like Caleb corrected himself with, everything will stay nice and factored. You don't have to worry about that. So please don't expand this when you're finding your derivative. So I'll show you what I mean just for the first derivative. So for instance, first derivative, product rule, 1 times x plus 2a to the fourth power plus x minus 3a times 4 times x plus 2a to the third times 1 by chain rule, right? We all know how to do product rule. Now, the nice thing is everything is already factored for you. You just have to factor out the common factor. And what common factor do we see? We actually see that there's a common factor of x plus 2a cubed, right? Because there's an x plus 2a on both, and the smaller of the two exponents is 3. So I'm going to factor out x plus 2a cubed. Now, what am I left with? I'm left with x plus 2a from the first term, and I'm left with 4 times x minus 3a from the second term, right? See how that's nice and factored? And let's see. So when I combine these things, I get 5x plus 2a minus 12a minus 10a. And then factoring out the common factor of 5, I get 5 times x plus 2a cubed times x minus 2a. Right. So by using product rule and then algebra, everything stays factored. Notice that I don't have a, I mean, I do have a fourth degree polynomial, but it's not all expanded out. It's, if I set this equal to zero, it's very easy to find that out. Now you can imagine if this were all expanded out, would you have been able to factor it back? Uh, probably not. <laughs> so that's what I would suggest. If you see a function like this, don't expand it, just use product rule. And if you use second, uh, the second derivative use a similar technique, you get 20x plus 2a squared times x minus 1a. And again, use the same technique. Use the product rule and factoring. That's it. There's a question like that on the homework. The reason I asked Caleb is because I know he did expand. Right, Caleb, remember that question you were doing? It was something like x times x plus 10 cubed or something? Yeah, that was a question on I the homework. It, but then I, yeah. I, took it, I took the derivative wrong as well, which was kind of. Exactly. So that's actually another reason why you don't want to expand, because you, you, you open yourself up for more opportunities for mistakes, right? You can like mess up one coefficient and everything is wrong. It's easier just to do product rule. Okay, so in any event, so now let's actually graph things. So remember, what is our roadmap? I was discussing this in office hours. How'd you get a 20? You just go through the derivative again, second derivative. Okay, so I was discussing um, the roadmap for graphing, right? We have three functions we're dealing with. We have f, we have f prime, and we have f double prime. Each of these things gives you something different. And you have to have this in your mind when you're doing these types of problems. If you don't understand what each of these functions gives you, then you're kind of going to be stumbling and you don't really have like any purpose in this problem, right? You need to know exactly where you're going with this problem because it's a long problem, right? 
So you need to know exactly what's happening. So let's review this very quickly. So what's happening with f or f prime? Like, tell me the things we can get and tell me which function tells you that. So Thomas says F's give, F gives you the asymptotes, right? Okay, so horizontal asymptotes, vertical. Actually, we usually write them in the other order. We usually do vertical first. That's how I've always been doing it. Vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes. Let's see what else other people are saying. Sarah is saying F prime shows whether it's increasing or decreasing. Good. Uh, Jacqueline says critical points from F prime. That's correct. But ultimately, I don't care about the critical points, but you do need the critical points to find the increasing, decreasing, right? Rachel says F prime gives min max, good. I'm actually gonna say local min max just to cl clarify that, right? Local min max. Do we have second derivatives yet in the chat? Let's see, Maya says second derivative is concavity. Good. I'll say concave up or down. And did we get the last thing? Yeah, Jacqueline says inflection points, very good. Now I'm gonna erase this because all of you have to know it, but this is something, if you are struggling with these types of problems, I strongly suggest that you make sure you have this little mini roadmap so that you know exactly what you're doing, right? I mean, it's literally like a checklist, right? You just go one by one and you say, okay, that's from F, that's from F prime and so on. And as another quick review for F prime and F double prime, what is our method for finding those things like increasing, decreasing and so on? So just for F prime and F double prime, what do we use? Sign chart or number line, right? So I'm just going to say sign chart. Everyone knows what that means. Okay, good. So Jacqueline, when you, when you do these problems, you have like a little index card with all this stuff, right? Yeah? Okay. So let's do first thing. So let's try to see if we can do this as fast as possible now, the rest of the problem. So what's the information from F? What are my asymptotes? So in the time it takes me to write these words, you better be able to tell me what the answers are. And if you need to see F, it's at the top of the screen. None. Jessica was for, or Ayana, Simran, and Jessica, and Jacqueline, Nesha, Isha, uh, you're all correct. So why does this have no horizontal asymptotes and no vertical asymptotes? Very quickly. F is a polynomial, right? Polynomials are continuous. Exactly. So let's kind of remind everyone of that. Polynomials. Good. So we're done with that. Uh, let's move on to the first derivative. So here's my first derivative. I'm gonna need that. Okay. So what are my cut points? Let's see, or you can tell me how, what I have to do, right? But the usual, the first step we do is what are the cut points? And my first derivative is over here. Did I already stump you? Is this A stumping you, this constant? Do we not like A? Do we not like constants? Someone, do you like constants? You don't like constants? What'd they ever do to you? They make it more complicated. That's what they did to you? They made things more <laughs> complicated? I mean, unless I set it equal or like set an equation in terms of A. Ooh, right, exactly. <laughs> Everything's gonna be in terms of A, exactly. So the cut points in this case, let's see, Yana wrote down 2A and negative 2A, right? If you set these equal to zero, I get negative 2A from that factor and 2A from that second factor, right? So those are my cut points. Negative 2A and X equals 2A. Now, this is also why I told you that A was positive. Remember, I did tell you that A was positive. That is That is important, right? Because how do you know which one is bigger than the other one, right? Because that's going to be important when you do your number line, right? You know, which order to put them in. So because A is positive, I know that negative 2A is less than 2A. But if A were negative, it would have been the other way around. It would have been trickier. So A is a positive number. So that's, that is important. So let's do our number line. So I have two cut points, negative 2A on the left 
two a on the right here. Let's put f prime over meow. Yeah. Okay, so when someone has the sign chart for me, let us know in chat. And then there's three intervals here. There's one, two, three. So you can just list the three signs in order. And once someone has it, we'll go over it in a little bit more detail. So I want to give you a second to maybe figure it out yourself. Again, your test points are probably going to have to be in terms of A, right? Everything here is in terms of A. Well, I get my PS5 today and Shadowlands came out yesterday. I was discuss I was debating just canceling class and be like, <laughs> I got the Rona. Um, and it's going to cure itself exactly at 1250 once my classes are done, so I can't teach class. But alas. Pause, negative, positive. I got the same thing. Good. So we got positive, negative, positive. All right, so let's see how that works. So for our test points, so something less than negative 2a, so negative 3a, right? Something in between negative 2a and positive 2a, what about 0? And something bigger than 2a, what about 3a? OK, so now let's see. So f prime of negative 3a, f prime of 0, f prime of 3a. So let's see. Let's look at each factor. The 5 doesn't matter. I'm just looking at everything else. So for this cube. When I plug in my endpoint, when I plug in my test points, rather, right, negative 3a plus 2a cubed gives me negative a cubed. That's a negative number, right? Because remember, a is positive. So that means I get negative here. 0 gives me 2a cubed. That's positive. 3a gives me 5a cubed, positive. For the next thing, I get, let's see, negative 5a, negative 2a, and 1a. Right. Don't be intimidated that everything is in terms of A. You're assuming that A is positive, so you really only have to look at the coefficients of A to determine whether the whole thing is positive or negative, right? OK, so given that it's positive, negative, positive, so now someone tell me, what do I interpret on my number line? If I see positive, negative, positive for the first derivative, what, what do you see for the original function? Increasing, decreasing, increasing. Also, hi, Isha. How are you doing? Good. And so now let's write down our answers, right? We all know we can now write down where is F decreasing, increasing, local min, and local max. So. So let's get some of these answers in the chat. And try to format them exactly how you would on an exam. I know that it's confusing with the MyLab. MyLab only takes round parentheses. I am aware of that. You know, it, it sucks. But oh well. I guess I should mention here, um, remember, the quizzes are reviewable on MyLab. If you accidentally used brackets on the MyLab quiz from last week um, and were marked wrong, um, please let me know. I can go over the quiz manually and give you back the points. Right, so if you didn't read my announcement about you have to use round parentheses no matter what in my lab, um, please let me know and I can look to see if you had the correct answer anyway. You can also see whether you had the correct answer. So let's see what we have in chat here. So Thomas says there's a local max at x equals negative 2a. And there's a local min at x equals 2a. Good. Right, because if I look at my sign chart, I have this shape here. Next, um, let's see. Caleb says the following for decreasing. It's that middle interval, and he's putting brackets on both. Very good, because the function's continuous. And then increasing on the other two intervals. Very good. I notice he did not use a union symbol. He separated them by a, a comma, right? It's separate. The intervals are listed separately. And it looked like Rachel got the same thing, and Anna got the same thing. So very good, everyone. Very good. All right, keep going. We can't just sit and say, oh, we're so good. We know how to do this problem. Got to keep going. Oh, look at me. I'm so great. I know how to do this. I want to take a break. I'm tired. Well, 
three hour exam. You better be in it for a marathon. A long haul. Uh oh. Should I calm you down now? Should I give you some sneak info, coordinator secret info about the final exam to calm you down over Thanksgiving? So the exam is two hours and 15 minutes, not three hours. It's going to be in three separate parts, 45 minutes each. You can complete them at any time during the three hour window. You do have to do them in order, but you can, you have three hours to complete it. So there's like 45 minutes of slack time. You can take a break between the parts. You can get up, you can go scream, you can go cry. Um, but altogether, it's 135 minutes out of 180 that you'll be working on the test. So isn't that nice? Most of it will be auto graded. There will be scans and uploads, but most of it is auto graded. So I, I should let you know about that also. How many questions is it? It'll probably be about 16 auto graded questions and maybe three scan and uploads. There might be an essay, but if there is an essay, it's going to be like the last exam. A lot of you, um, some, well, some of you panicked about essay questions in the last exam, but I hope you realize the essay question on the last exam, you didn't really have to write math at all almost, right? It was very, very little. So um, write that L'Hopital's question, you know, explaining, asking you to explain L'Hopital's problem or L'Hopital's rule for a product, right? It was mostly English you had to type, right? It wasn't really math. So if there is another essay question in the final, it's going to be something like that, where it's mostly English, not math. Remember, I promised you that. I promised you you would not have to write down your work. All right, anyways. So for the second derivative, what are our cut points? We get x equals negative 2a again, and we get x equals 1a from the other factor. OK, good. And now we do another sign chart, right? It's like, like you should be exhausted by these. You should have to. Take this a little bit smaller. Like you should be so sick of sign charts, right? All right, test points. So we have negative 3a, right? That's less than negative 2a. What's in between? Zero again. That's good. And what's bigger? 2a is bigger. So again, let's look. Now the night now about this second derivative, notice that the first factor is always positive because I have that square. So actually that's not going to affect only the second factor is going to affect anything, right? That square is always positive no matter what. So if I'm looking at just the x minus a now, I see I get negative, negative, positive. Uh-oh. Why do I say uh-oh? So it's not a it's not too big of a deal, but remember we did have a question like this um, where we got the same thing twice in a row, right? Two negatives or two positives. So remember there was just like a little subtlety to that. So I concave down, concave down, concave up. Right, so Yana is already writing it. Um, so you don't separate the notation, right? You have to combine them, exactly. Um, so Jacqueline, you said that one was a, a that one was good. Oh, that was for the, essay question, saddle point. So actually, yes. Um, so what I was really going for, I wanted to make sure that everyone knew not to separate the intervals, right? You just include the negative 2a. But Jacqueline actually just points something out. If I have two concave downs here, but negative 2a did have a local maximum. Or hold on, did I mess up here? No, I didn't. Oh, no, 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 no. Um, Sorry, I was going to say something about a. Actually, there's a there's a oh no, that's the other solution. Never mind. Jacqueline actually confused me. Jacqueline's wrong. Um, <laughs> um, a what's it called? A saddle point occurs when you have a critical point, but the first derivative does not change sign. The second derivative not changing sign. Actually, that makes sense, right? Because negative two a is a maximum, so I should have a negative concavity there. OK, so let's now put everything together. 
the other um, question I had prepared for today I actually did have a saddle point. That's why I got initially confused. So let's get concave down, concave up. So let's start writing this in chat. Concave up, concave down, concave up, and inflection point. What have we got for me? Someone, is that how you would have? Is that how you would format it on an exam? Or you're you're in you're in my lab mode, right? So uh, concave down is negative infinity to a. But notice very clearly how Simran did include, right? She did not make these two intervals separate. She didn't go negative infinity to negative two a, negative two a to a, right? It's actually together. And then the concave up is a to infinity. Good. Um, do we get the inflection point? Yes, we have x equals a has the inflection point. Good. All right, any questions so far? I haven't really paused for questions. I'm just assuming people would ask questions, but maybe that's not always a good assumption. Any questions up until this point about any part of the problem? Asymptotes, F prime, F double prime. How do you feel about these problems? Are they, are they fun now? Are they getting fun? Don't you have a good satisfaction when you solve these problems? Right, they're long and you get like, yes, low key, yeah. It's okay. You don't have to be low key. It's fun. Math is fun. It's you, you. You should be high key about math being fun. I am, but I guess I'm the corny teacher, so I have to be. Doctor G. Yes, I Janelle. Just, so you um you don't separate them again. You said when um you have two like uh two concave okay. down. So mm -hmm. I don't separate them because the function's continuous there. Okay. So I have to include it. Um, here's a question. Um, to, to related to Janelle's question, because Janelle's question was really, why do I include the negative 2a? Can someone give me a condition, um, a very common condition where I would not, where I actually would separate them? Yeah, for instance, if I had a vertical asymptote, I would separate them, right? But this is a polynomial, there were no asymptotes, so nothing like that. Okay, and now let's get the summary and graph. Okay, so there's my function. So let's get important points. So let's see. So I had, so here's my x values, x values, y values, and type. So I have negative 3a, that's y equals zero. So I'm just putting that there because it's a zero. It's a, you know, that's where it crosses the x-axis. We had negative 2a, zero, and that's both a zero and a max, then we had x equals a. And if you plug that in, you get negative 162 a to the fifth. And that was an inflection point. And then we had 2a. That is negative 256 a to the fifth. Uh, oh, sorry, I wrote negative 3a. I have to correct this. Uh, that should be a min. Sorry, it's not negative 3, it's positive 3a. So that should go. Right? We can see from the first factor, if I plug in 3a, I get 0. So that's good to know where it crosses the x-axis. And then let's summarize everything in our chart. Okay, so we're gonna put um, increasing, decreasing up top and the concavity down below. So what do I have to break this up? I have to break it up at negative 2a, uh, at a and at 2a. And if I go back to my work, what do I see? I see it's increasing up till negative two, then it's decreasing until two and then increasing after that. And then for the concavity, I get down until a and then up after that. Okay, so that's what I have. 
So hopefully everyone should be pretty good at summarizing this and running these little charts. I mean, you don't have to do it this way. I mean, I, I like the summary chart because I can see right away, like, you know, where everything is. Now let's. So all of my Y values are pretty much negative. So I'm put it like this. So I have, let's see, negative 2a. Then I have a, 2a. Just give me, oops, just give me a second. Okay, so negative a, negative 2a, that's a, 2a. 3a. Okay. And let's mark all these points. So I have a point here. That's going to be a maximum. So let me make sure I put a little horizontal tangent line there. Then at a, I'm down at negative 162 or whatever. And then 2a, I'm down even further. At 3a, I'm back up at zero. Okay, cool. And I do have a horizontal tangent line over here as well. And I think now we're ready for everything else. Oof. So we have increasing, decreasing, decreasing, increasing, right? So that's our skeleton and then increasing after that as well. And then we just put in our concavity. So concave down, concave down, then concave up. and concave up, and then it just keeps on going. There you go, there's my function. All right, questions about that? 